Right, this thing on. Good morning. Um, so, I'm not going to talk about all the other things that you're going to um, get in the next two days. Um, such essential ingredients to 100% Java applications like XML and HTML5. Uh, or the fascinating features due in Java 8, which uh, current release schedule has it for 2018, uh, where Java will enjoy features that other, every other language on the planet has been enjoying for the last decade. Um, features like lambdas invented in the 1950s. Um, and, you know, other such marvels as that. No, I want to refocus the conversation on you, the programmer. Um, what is it that motivates and drives? What are the challenges? What is the nature of this stuff, this programming? So I'll start off, um, I guess I'll start off with a, a very simple contemplation, a sort of a very simple definition. Um, programmer. Now, a lot of people use the term developer, but I'm, I'm really very, I'm still very fond of the term programmer because it kind of, well, first of all, there's a lot of developers that quite frankly can't program. Um, second, the default definition in the dictionary of um, developer uh, relates to real estate uh, and trashing people's property and things like that. So these are very negative connotations. Um, this has the benefit of actually, well, it does what it says on the tin. One who writes computer programs. I mean, how hard is that? It says... This is what it's about. What does writing involve? And this one I absolutely love. I dug this one out. A person who prepares and tests programs for devices. Who knew? Programs are actually supposed to test. Good grief. Uh, and then, obviously, the definition that uh, we all can relate to, an organism capable of turning caffeine into code. Um, um, what is it that this stuff of programming is? What is the, uh, the area of interest and the motivation? Uh, and what's the challenge? Because it's a very, very broad field. It is actually one of the hardest things that human beings engage in. And the problem is that we don't recognize it directly as hard because it is not a physical thing. Uh, human beings are very simple creatures. We are very impressed by things of scale. If you ever stand at the bottom of a large dam, for example, I've stood at the bottom of the uh, Itaipu Dam um, uh, between Brazil and Argentina, and it is physically impressive. You cannot help but be impressed. When you stand at the bottom of a large structure, it's awe-inspiring. When you look at a block of code, yeah, you don't get that feeling. When somebody says, this is a million lines of code, your heart sinks, rather than feeling, wow, that's awesome. That's an amazing feat of engineering. And yet, these are some of the most complex structures that human beings create. Uh, for example, uh, if you consider something like a novel, and if you consider sort of a fairly chunky sort of uh, uh, fantasy style novel, it's about 100,000 words. That's 100,000 words laid out in a linear order for single execution. There are no ifs there, okay? And there's no whiles unless you fell asleep reading it and you have to go back. So what was that? There is no repetition. There are no control structures. There is certainly no concurrency. And that's 100,000 words. That's not 100,000 lines with optional execution and repetition and a gazillion paths all the way through it. And this is engineered, and I know a number of novelists, and they, they spend months, if not years, writing this stuff. And it's nowhere near as complex as a software system. This stuff is really hard. It just doesn't look physically impressive. So we have that, and then we have the other source of challenge, the people that want the code. So, it's a very complex world. Now, my, my area of interest, I have a, a number of areas of interest, and uh, I uh, was the editor of the 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know um, project and book, which is a, an open source and crowdsource book. Um, I like the Japanese translation. Um, I have no idea what it says. Um, but it's a beautiful way of killing trees. If you are going to kill trees for books, this is how you do it. The, the, the quality of the paper is magnificent. Their choice of template is also inspiring. It even has a dust cover and it's a paperback. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a thing of beauty, whereas everything else is just a, a thing of standard print presses. Now, conveniently translated back into English was my observation. Well, I've translated it back into English. Observation in the preface on the nature of the stuff that we work on. There is an art, craft, and science to programming that extends far beyond the program. The act of programming 
marries the discrete world of computers with the fluid world of human affairs. Now, that's actually part of the challenge. Programmers mediate. They are the go-betweens. They are the, it's not simply that you create a very complex structure. It's that you have to go between these two worlds, the negotiated and uncertain truths of business, and the crisp, uncompromising domains of bits, bytes, and higher constructed types. It's the fact that there is a bridge. This is the challenge. This is one of the things that is intellectually demanding, but also intellectually rewarding. But because of the lack of a physical nature to, the, uh, to a lot of what people do, there is always a, a challenge. People reach out. They try and find a metaphor for what it is that they do. They try and compare themselves with other professions. This is inevitable. And people look out and they sort of say, oh, we are like architects, we are like mathematicians, we are like gardeners, we are... and so on. Just to put your mind at rest, other professions do this as well. And it's occasionally quite amusing when you bump into somebody else and they say, we need to be more like software developers. Are you, really? Are you sure? Do you want the luxury of those delays? I mean, what is it that you... What, what, what? But this is the thing. When we look at other professions, when we look at other disciplines, we see them at a distance. We see them from one side. They're almost like, uh, you yeah, know, we see a simplified view, as you would of anything at a distance. You see one aspect of it. You don't see the complexity and the strife that goes on within that community. And actually, to be fair, there's also another aspect, particularly when we look at some, uh, some of the engineering disciplines in architecture. Um, when you look at something at a great distance, you also look back through time. It's like looking, through, uh, looking at stars. You go back in time. We see other professions as they were decades ago. They've all moved on. But we do like to do this. And occasionally we want to show that we're not just engineers and architects. We want to be artists. Ah, yeah, I did put the word art there. Sometimes people take this a little bit too far. And the, uh, the analogy fails down. So, so Paul Graham, uh, uh, list hacker extraordinaire, and uh, uh, founder of Y Combinator, he, he, made, he wrote this uh, essay about 10 years ago that turned into a book, Hackers and Painters, where he really wanted to draw the analogy between people who are into code and people who paint. And he said, hacking and painting have a lot in common. In fact, of all the different types of people I've known, hackers and painters are all among the most alike. Um, quite frankly, he needs to meet more people. Uh, <laughs> Really, you know, it's like, yeah, of the three people I've met, that one is most like me. Really, uh, there is a, there's a, hackers are so not like painters in so many ways. Um, but I just think it's because he's familiar with painting. And there's a very strong tendency to say, well, here's a hobby of mine, and I'm going to project that hobby onto the space. Now, that's not to say you cannot draw parallels, but you can overdo it a bit. And so he overdid it for a whole book, in fact. Um, however, he does make a relevant observation. What hackers and painters have in common is that they're both makers. Well, good. There's lots of people who are makers. My kids are makers. They make stuff. They also destroy stuff. You know, there's a sort, of a, a sort of karmic balance to the universe in that. Um, he could have written hackers and children. And actually, that would have probably been just as valid, if not more so, because there is a delightful playfulness that a lot gets a lot of people into programming. You know, I didn't get into programming to deliver business value. <laughs> <laughs> That's just something we say to get through the interview. <laughs> Good God, I mean, if you actually get out of bed in the morning because that's what motivates you, you are at the wrong conference. <laughs> okay, I mean, where's the passion, you know? So, yeah, uh, but there is a joy, there's a childlike joy to some of the stuff, and if we lose that, there, there's, there, there is something missing. Along with composers, architects, and writers, what hackers and painters are trying to do is make good things. Well, you know what? We could have said that about anything. That doesn't really make painting a very good analogy, I'm afraid. Um, and the painting thing I came across recently, um, I just, uh, beautiful picture, Van Gogh, the starry night, painted it in um, Provence, and there is um, a, uh, there's a web page. Agile models are paintings, not photographs. What is it with paintings? Does it, do these people actually paint? In fact, I'm pretty sure Don Wells doesn't take photographs either. I take photographs and really, no. And he makes a point. He tries to make a point about, tries to make a point about the, um, the expression, the impression of the starry night. And he compares this with a picture, a photograph that is actually of a starry night with the stars in their exact positions. And he kind of implies that 
Van Gogh is just kind of giving you a vague impression of this stuff. Van Gogh was a geek. A geek with, you know, a bit short on ears. But a geek nonetheless. My, 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 my objection is that they are not paintings. Uh, these are, if anything, sketches. But the point about what Van Gogh did is actually you can tell where he was. Somebody's actually analyzed this. The stars are in the right position for where he was in Provence. He didn't just splash a few bits of paint around. He was faithful to a certain level of detail and interpreted beyond that. So if people are going to make very grand claims about it's like painting, they really need to you know, go a little bit further. Now, this idea that people will project a, a personal hobby and things like that, I mean, I'm going to be guilty of that, but it's also one of the reasons that I um, personally am very suspicious of overdoing these things. One of the things I do uh, in my spare time is write. I write short fiction, and it's been included in places. Um, and it's even, even in New Scientist. I've actually had fiction published in New Scientist. And the thing is, I write this stuff, and I'm going to say uh, it's a bit, probably a bit more, given I draw as well, it's a bit more like software development and programming and the joy of that than um, anything like painting. But I'm not going to overdo the analogy because you have to be very careful. There is obviously a gap between these other endeavors and the very stuff of working with code. But there are some points that I want to bring out that we can use, some metaphors and some parallels that are uh, very helpful. Um, first of all, let's start off with the idea that people are motivated by pride and passion and a little bit of, a little bit of playfulness. This is from the Clue Train Manifesto, the, published ver uh, the, the book version of it. People in high tech take pride in their work. They are individuals who see the details of the things they produce in the light of the trials and triumphs they experience while creating products. So we have the idea of creativity, but there is also the idea of product, um, this is one of the things that is perhaps missing a little bit from that idea of um, paintings. Paintings are not considered to be products per se. Um, there is a sort of a slightly more utilitarian feel that does not deny the fact that there's some kind of art and craft to code, but there's a slightly more utilitarian aspect um, to software development. Uh, a very different grounding. It comes from a very different place. But also, at the same time, it's, we don't... <sighs> Don't, we're not drawn to words like productivity and the anonymity that gives us. In the courage of creation, they find a place to hang their individuality. Programmers and technotypes appreciate elegant spare code and the occasional well-turned architectural hack. And I can definitely relate to that. There is an appeal here to some kind of aesthetic, but at the same time, there's a sort of, a, a sort of idea that you know, you're messing about with something a little bit. And it's kind of good to think around it, a little bit of ingenuity and cleverness. Again, this is something that we may not find simply in the visual arts. So there's something going a little bit further. But at the same time, um, one of the things that is not necessarily obvious in some of the other professions we might try and compare ourselves to is uh, a point that Dick Gabriel makes in this book, Patterns of Software. Uh, now out of print, but you can get the, um, uh, you can get the um, PDF from his website. Um, and uh, <laughs> just a sort of minor point on photography um, and why photography is perhaps not the best analogy for doing models is that with a photograph, you can make anything look like something else. This was taken in the UK. It has sunshine. <laughs> yeah? It's amazing what you can do with Photoshop. Um, <laughs> but um, and a, again, uh, Dick Gabriel, is, he's a maker. He's a, in the sense, well, is he a maker? No. Is he poetry making? I don't know. Um, he's a poet as well as a software geek and another Lisp guy. Um, and he says a number of things in this book, very interesting about software development, partly autobiographical, but one of the observations he makes is one of the missing observations when people talk about um, software architecture. When people talk about software architecture, they are normally appealing to um, one of two different perspectives on architecture. One is the idea of grand structure, big picture. Grand structure and the style in which something is created. And we can definitely see that there's scope for that when we talk about software. We can talk about the style of a system. We can talk about the collective set of decisions. They follow a particular system, a particular style. Even if the developers were unaware of it explicitly, a system can be said to follow particular um, styles that make sense. It's not just technology choices. We 
You can see uh, choices in terms of degrees of concurrency, the degrees of mutability, um, how you separate in these key decisions. So there's something there about classic architectural style that translates. In other cases, we are talking about something, again, a little more utilitarian. Um, the idea of architecture relating to the kind of thing that you build. Uh, the, the architecture for a school is very, very different to something like the architecture for a hospital. Standard functional buildings. But there's something else here as well. And this is what Dick actually draws our attention to. Habitability. This is one of the things that is a little different to many of the other artistic endeavors people engage in. Software is something that people execute, but the code is an environment in which programmers live. They create their own environment. They create a space in which they spend time. What is the quality of that time and that space? Habitability is a characteristic of source code that enables programmers, coders, bug fixers, and people coming to the code later in its life to understand its construction and intentions and to change it comfortably and confidently. Is your system like that? Does it feel comfortable? Is it, is it sort of, you know, it's, this is actually slightly different. This is a different aesthetic appeal. We're not talking about elegance here. We're not talking about beauty. We're talking about habitability, which is a little more humdrum, a little more ordinary. But would, when you go in in the morning, do you want to spend time in that code base? Is it a place you want to be? And it, do you know where everything is? Not because you've had it drilled into you. Oh, God, yes, of course it's there, because we always get bugs there. Yeah? Or, oh, no, you don't want to go into that package. Only dark things go in there. You know? <laughs> or, or that package, okay, we only pair program in that package because we've seen all the teen horror movies. We know that when the teenagers go into the scary house and there's five of them and two go that way, two go that way, one goes that way, who dies first? It's always the one on their own. So we only pair program in this package. <laughs> we don't want code like that. We want something that is comfortable, a place that is livable. This metaphor is the missing metaphor of a lot of software architecture. It is the fact that it creates a space, not simply that is executed, but a space that people actually spend their time in. So it is not merely a, a painting on a wall. It is not merely a poem on a page. It is actually the very space. You create the construct in which you live and spend most of your time. This is a very different kind of thing. So this is what we want in software. Now, this all sounds potentially a little bit touchy-feely. Um, a lot of people like to think of software as being the command of knowledge and skill. They like to think of themselves as, well, that's, that's a homage to the great man, George Bull, after whom we have a data type, and indeed a system of propositional calculus. And in th this, uh, we th these days, with our slightly slightly snappier desire for titles, we generally call this book The Laws of Thought. But when um, George Boole uh, formulated his system of logic, uh, he gave it this classically Victorian title, An Investigation of the Laws of Thought on which are founded the mathematical theories of logic and probabilities. Now, this all sounds very grand, and it also, it also might reflect a sort of self-image, the idea that, there's a lot of people that think, you know, yeah, programmers, we are logical. We understand logic in the way that mere mortals do not. We understand the fact that you can mess about with the everyday use of the word or and surprise people. We have a degree of pedantry that goes with the word and that other people do not. Yeah, so we, we think we understand this stuff. Well, quite frankly, having dealt with different communities and I deal with the writing community, um, uh, and I do originally have a degree in physics, so I will say, uh, when it comes to logical thinking, physicists, programmers, writers. Uh, programmers really are not as logical as they think they are. Maybe they use up too much of their logic in the code, and they're unable to do anything else outside. Um, it turns out, this is, this is one of the great discoveries of, of recent years, it turns out that um, programmers are human. I know, who knew? Um, and therefore, they are susceptible to all of the messiness of humanity and the way that our brain has structured, uh, been structured by the haphazard forces of evolution. This rather good book by Gary Marcus, uh, Kluge, um, a solution that is clumsy or inelegant yet surprisingly effective. He, he applies this to the human brain and the way that we think. And he makes this observation. 
Are human beings noble in reason and infinite in faculty, as William Shakespeare famously wrote? Perfect in God's image, as some biblical scholars have asserted? Hardly. It turns out we are riddled with thinking errors and hacks and shortcuts. It's like a piece of enterprise coding. So here is a very simple example of some of the distortions that your thinking will go through. Okay? Uh, this observation uh, from New Scientist a couple of years ago about uh, the, uh, the issues. Um, economic psychology to explain why we collectively took on loans that events proved so unwise. First was materialism, second's money. Finally, we have the most spectacular deviation from rationality, the massive myopia with which we approach choices between good things that will arrive at different points in the future. Humans are hopeless at such intertemporal choice. By the way, if you're in a meeting at some point in the future, feel free to use the phrase intertemporal choice. Just throw that in there. Just see if people get it. Yeah? Just sound, raise yourself up, put them down. Yeah, confuse them a little bit. If it's a difficult Monday morning, technology is your, or terminology is your friend. Consistently choosing to take small benefits sooner rather than large benefits later. In fact, there is a specific term for this known as the hyperbolic discounting effect. Uh, feel free to use that in a meeting as well. You take them with intertemporal choice and you get them with the other one. Hyperbolic discounting effect. What is that? Although individuals in some markets display it, economists dislike it. I love this fact. The economists dislike it because it's irrational, which explains why economists are in the worst position to actually figure out what's going on with the economy. Well, we don't like that theory. It looks a little bit messy. Yes, but the market's a mess. Yes, but that theory, I mean, it's not elegant. Under hyperbolic scanning, a person has a strong preference for getting something today rather than tomorrow. And yet, when the future arrives, they want it right now. How does this relate to the, your choice of practices? Well, let me take a very simple example. Testing. And our choice of whether or not we're going to test now. I was with a team just last week. And they pretty much said the same thing. You know, I said, well, I, I said, where are the tests for this code? Of all the pieces of code that you could have possibly chosen to not test, this was not one of them, okay? This could really do with tests. It would really help, I don't know, the universe. Um, and, and so uh, they said, oh, well, we don't have enough time. And I said, well, you, you guys must have loads of time. You have more time than any other company I know because everybody else would have had to have written tests because you guys spend so much time debugging and writing documents. You know, that's a, that's, that's, you, you spend lots of time debugging and writing documents. You must have more time than anybody else, because most companies I know don't have the amount of time that you have. They actually have to ship stuff. Yeah? But only a company with the luxury of time that you have would be able to not test. So there is this idea, oh, we don't have the time to do it today, but we have plenty of time to deal with the consequences later. And we will not actually see that there is a cause-effect relationship. It's also not very good with probabilities. Our inability to account for time also has some rather interesting effects. Um, programmers like to believe that they are good at multitasking. Uh, yeah, threads. That was a big mistake, wasn't it? It turns out that we're not very good at this thing. Multitasking. You can see it with people because they, they do this. So, well, I'll, I'll do that and then I will, whilst I'm finishing this bit on this, uh, this code, I will help somebody else with that project as well. I'll just slip this in there. I won't bother putting an estimate in. Somebody asked me, could you make this small change? And I said, yes. And it'll only take a couple of minutes. And there you are, late at night, a couple of minutes later. Um, and and you're trying to remember what it is that you were supposed to be doing. You divide your time, and you have a high interrupt rate. And this is certainly not helped by some of our work environments, um, which then further encourage people to add additional sources of distraction, um, the favorite being plug into some music. Um, you might be interested in the studies about um, intellectually based work and music. They're not quite compatible. That's, that's a polite way of putting it. Uh, music can get you to a space, but once you're there, really turn it off. Uh, and if it's, uh, if it's got pounding 140 beats per minute and it's so cool that you're just in the flow, this is the problem. You're probably not, but you think you are. Self-perception is one of the biggest blind spots that we have. And unfortunately, because programs often identify with working alone, they don't necessarily have the feedback loop that says, that's crap or that really doesn't work. Or indeed, you do have a bug there, which is why we have the humility of tests to keep us grounded. But this observation... Social scientists have long assumed it's impossible to process more than one string of information at a time. Brain just can't do it. 
But many researchers have guessed that people who appear to multitask must have superb control over what they think about and what they pay attention to. There's a lot of programmers who go, yeah, yeah, that's me. That's me. I can do that. I can maintain multiple streams of information. You know, it might not be pure multitasking, but actually, you know. So these guys set about find out what is it that gives these these uh, multitaskers their edge. What is their gift? We kept looking for what they're better at, and we didn't find it. It turns out um, people who are regularly bombarded with several streams of electronic information do not pay attention. Sorry, let me just tweet that. Control their memory or switch from one job to another, as well as those who prefer to complete one task at a time. The conclusion of their research is that if you have somebody who says, yeah, no, I'm pretty good at multitasking, and you have somebody who says, no, I'm absolutely hopeless at multitasking, and you need some multitasking-related work done, give it to the one who says they're hopeless. Because it turns out they're actually better at focusing and maintaining control over their task. Now, this is quite a challenge, and it's almost an inevitable consequence of programming that you do end up with an element of multitasking. There's a lot of natural context switching. And there's also a lot of... Uh, Unnatural context switching, the environment encourages that, unfortunately. But there's a lot of the natural stuff. When you partition a large code base, you flip from class to class. You change the context. Each class defines a context. It's a space in which you think. It has a set of ideas. You're constantly bouncing around these. It's not just flipping windows. You're actually changing, as it were, abstraction concepts. And so there's an inevitable amount that you are going to be multitasking at some degree. You don't have this linear narrative that something like a novel has. Now, there's some interesting consequences for this. So I want to go back to uh, Paul Graham, who wrote a very interesting piece um, four years ago, Maker's Schedule versus Manager's Schedule. You see he likes the word maker, people that make stuff. Um, I prefer, cre I, I don't know, the word creative sounds better to me, but okay. He says, one reason programmers dislike meetings so much is that they're on a different type of schedule from other people. Meetings cost them more. For someone on the maker's schedule, having a meeting is like throwing an exception. It doesn't merely cause you to switch from one task to another. It changes the mode in which you work. The idea is that a manager's schedule is one that is opportunistic. It's filled. It's, oh, look, there's an hour and a half there. We'll put an interview in there. There's, a, there's an hour slot there. Well, I think I can fit in a telephone call there or uh, have a conference call at that point. So in other words, an opportunistic use of time. Whereas the maker's schedule, you need, well, who knows what time you start work? Who knows what time you end? You're in the zone. You're focusing. Somebody schedules a meeting right in the middle of that. Boom. It's like an exception. It takes you not simply out of the context. It takes you to somewhere else. So there is this um, challenge, and this is a problem for those of you who work in larger corporate environments and uh, who may be called upon in your more senior roles to do things like um, sit in on uh, interviews. Uh, interview various candidates, or to uh, engage in meetings, there is a temptation when people look at your calendar to sort of say, oh, well, they've got a free hour there. Or, oh, gosh, Thursday looks really busy for them. Um, although they have a free hour there, I'll load balance and put the meeting on Wednesday. Actually, in some ways, it would be better. In other words, the, the maker schedule would be more appreciative of putting it in the heavy duty day. In other words, let's keep a few days clear from this kind of work that is scheduled at a particular time that will cause interruption. Let's actually have a whole day of disruption. And personally, I, I use this. I work for myself. And uh, this is something that I, I know that I do. I have sort of admin days where it's just like, yeah, it's going to be emails. It's going to be bits and pieces. I will schedule phone calls. I will do whatever. Um, I will generally not schedule phone calls. I try to avoid that because the whole idea of using a phone seems somehow very retro and sort of, you know. But nonetheless, there are some people out there who want to do that. And, uh, they, and, and phone proxies like Skype and things like that, they want to do this. But I will try and schedule it on those days rather than days where I'm trying to actually be in the zone. However... That would be great if that were the solution. The problem is, we're human. It's not that easy. There's another area of conflict that uh, comes into this one. Um, decision fatigue. It explains why ordinarily sensible people get angry at colleagues' families, splurge on clothes, buy junk food at the supermarket, and can't resist the dealer's office to rust-proof their new car, or, you know, once they bamboozled you with all of these options... You, somebody says, oh, what about this as well? And you just can't say anything but no or yes. Yes, I'll have that. It's why the little sweeties and things like that are at the checkout point. Okay, and if you've got kids, by the way, yeah. They <laughs> this is the, it's, it's not that you're finally caving into your kids. It's you've had enough decision-making. 
it's, it's a problem. You actually exhaust yourself. Um, so no matter how rational and uh, high-minded you try to be, you can't make a decision after decision without paying a biological price. If you are constantly making decisions, it will take its toll on you. You need to take a break. Um, one of the classic examples of research for this was the um, uh, judgments um, uh, given out by judges uh, uh, in terms of evaluating whether or not uh, prisoners um, uh, should be allowed um, parole. And it turns out, we'd love to think that they were doing the, making their decisions on the merits of their case, but it turns out that there was a very distinct profile through the day. And uh, more pr prisoners received parole earlier on than later on. In other, words, the er in other words, the fewer decisions the judge had had to make, the more likely it was a rational decision. But as time goes by, the more choices your brain makes, it looks for shortcuts in one of two different ways. One shortcut is to become reckless, the impulsive buying. The other one is to become very, very um, conservative and do nothing, which is why you don't grant parole, because, well, it's just the same as it was before. We don't change anything. Now, what does this have to do with the way that we organize our time? Well, if you put all of your meeting and decision-based activities on one day, oh, bugger. That means that the decisions you make later will be worse than the decisions you make earlier on. Naturally, you'll be more exhausted. So that kind of day can only work effectively if you put lots of breaks in it. And the managers love putting breaks in days like that, obviously. Yeah? In other, so this, this is a problem. You see, there's a conflict of interest. Because uh, what, they, what they discovered is that after a break, particularly where um, the, the judge had had something um, very strong glucose-based drink, after a break, they were back up and sparky. But you need a good half hour to get that through. So you can't just go from one thing to a, one area of decision making to another area of decision making without, um, without taking a break. So it turns out that we are incredibly bad at multitasking. You need to put spaces in there if you're going to make this work. So it turns out that our, this whole being human thing really interferes with the activities of being a professional programmer. Um, but also, let us be honest as well. What about this idea that we work alone? Now, this is one of the areas where um, I'm going to say that there is a very big difference between some of the arts and programming. Um, painters work alone. Most, pretty much all writers, the majority of writers do their writing on their own. Programming is not really like that. In a professional environment, software is not developed, typically by a lone individual. That, it's not, I'm not going to say that era has gone. I'm not going to say that people don't write code on their own. This certainly does occur. But the whole shift in the last 20 years to team-based development, the idea that actually having a team of one is more of an oddity than it is a normality, it, it, there's been a major shift. So all of a sudden, people have had to get to this idea of actually how do we divide up work? How do we create these things? It's not just the big military projects people were talking about in the 70s and 80s that demanded teams. It's almost anything now. Um, so how do we deal um, with this kind of idea of um, improving collective intelligence? Uh, a phrase that has become very popular is the wisdom of crowds. This book by James Sirowicki was the trigger for that. It was written in 2003. Um, and people like to sort of use this, and occasionally managers will use this phrase in amidst other phrases, um, and it's worth understanding what is meant by the wisdom of crowds. The wisdom of crowds is not just getting a bunch of people together. Um, it's not just getting a bunch of like-minded people. That's called groupthink. It turns out that a bunch of people can get really, ri you know, a group of people who are otherwise intelligent can be really, really stupid when you get them together. Uh, they will do things that an individual of lesser intelligence would not even consider. I, I offer you politics. Um, so there's this kind of group thing okay, that goes on. So there are some very well-defined, and this is a, an important point, the bit that was overlooked, because you know, the people that didn't actually read the book and just read the cover, um, it says fairly clearly in the book, okay, here's how it works. Four conditions that characterize wise crowds. Diversity of opinion. Oh, you mean people are not supposed to agree with me? Oh, crap. That's a good thing. A friend of mine, he ran, um, he ran a company where they he kind of got rid of the people that thought differently. Yeah, that startup became a shutdown. Um, it turns out you need to have a little bit of that. But at the same time, you need to have certain independence of thinking. 
Because this is the problem. We are very easily influenced by those around us for a number of other reasons and uh, cognitive biases that we, uh, we can, uh, have. Decentralization, this, uh, the idea that you should be able to draw on separate pools of knowledge, that you don't have the same background and the same thinking style as those. So it's not just having a difference of opinion. It's actually being able to draw on and have a completely different worldview um, and a source of knowledge. And aggregation, you have to bring it all together. A lot of companies squander, as it were, this, this intellectual capacity that they have by not having a mechanism of pulling this together. So it turns out that people can work in groups effectively if they are organized in a way. Um, you know, we, we see this with open source uh, uh, software. That it turns out that there are particular characteristics of open source communities. Um, we also see that there are particular distributions in open source communities, the more successful ones and the less successful ones, the characteristics that they have, and that there is often discussion and there is often a little bit of infighting, um, but there is also a way of organizing uh, people's thinking and expressing that. So that turns out to be quite important. Now, on this observation, there's little correlation between a group's collective intelligence and the IQs of its individual members. This is important because a number of... Companies try to, they, they try to, well, it's a bit like English football, really, um, in the sense that uh, they, don't, they don't interview for a team. They interview for individuals who are competent. Um, and this is, um, uh, and you get this with uh, the England football team, who are individually, um, you know, very good players. But as a team, they're absolutely hopeless. And people who train as a team actually run circles around them. You know? So it, it turns out that there is a different kind of dynamic here that is, uh, is underutilized, and we get distracted from the fact that that's actually quite important. Now, one of the interesting things um, is it turns out, and this is going to surprise very, very, well, there's a few of you it's not going to surprise, and there's a lot of you that might be surprised, and I'm sad that this is the case. Um, it turns out uh, if a group includes more women, its collective intelligence rises. Um, this was the... Uh, 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 outcome of some interesting research um, where they weren't actually looking for this effect, but when they looked back over their, their data set, they said, that's really interesting. All the groups with at least one woman in did better. Uh, and this appeals back to this whole point of diverse thinking. It also uh, establishes a very different way of looking at team composition um, that's counterintuitive and not logical according to the Boolean way of thinking, but certainly works out in the human way of thinking. So, when we look at this whole endeavor of um, programming, this activity of creating code in order to create software systems, when people think of teams, they often think of this as being just multiplying up the number of people coding. Now, I made an observation in the late 90s, um, which has kind of turned into a little bit of a meme. Uh, typing is not the bottleneck. Um, Sebastian Hermida did this uh, graphic. Um, typing is not the bottleneck in software development, and yet many organizations try to treat it as if typing is the main problem. We need more typists. We need more people who can match curly brackets. And then we get our development environments, our IDEs, uh, our despair. I mean, I sometimes think, you know, people really just try Notepad, okay? If you can't code in Notepad, you can't code. I'm not suggesting this is a generally a way of producing software, but it's, a, it's an interesting constraint to work to. Because you get so many people who say, oh, I can't live without my, you know, I want to be able to take a field and automatically generate getters and setters for it. Out. Evil. Okay? These habits create enterprise code. Okay? Enterprise code is not a thing. I use enterprise code to mean bad code. Okay? It's, there are these little habits. We have these environments that allow us to create bad code quickly. They auto-generate the wrong thing far more easily than somebody pausing for a moment and going, you know, I feel this, this identifier name, this, this manager factory controller factory manager, I, I feel uncomfortable with that name. Oh, it's okay, you can just complete it. Where people are, you know, where, where, I'm, look, where I'm reviewing code, and people are saying, I'm saying, look, this line is too long. Oh, it's okay, I've got an HD monitor. I said, well, that's great for you. But, you know, speaking as, uh, speaking as a, a slightly evolved ape, I have not caught up with this. In fact, humans have not caught up with this. It turns out that even 80 characters is too long for human beings. It turns out 60 characters. If, if you doubt that, could I suggest you go and have a chat with a UX, uh, UI designer and ask them if they would like to lay out their wonderful landing page with 
column, uh, with, uh, with 100 columns or over. People, people don't read that way. You don't want neck strain when you're reading the thing. Okay, where's that identifier end? It's somewhere off there. That's good job I got a second monitor. No, you're solving the wrong problem. So there's, there's a problem here. We have this stuff auto-generating. It's okay. You can actually program a whole system just by doing um, auto-completion. Yeah, just sit there and I'll take the su first suggestion. I'll take the first suggestion. Yep, enterprise, ship it. Do you want to generate some? Oh, even my favorite, testing. Unit tests in Eclipse, absolutely brilliant. Targeted at a class. You have a class with A, B, C, three methods. I can auto-generate some tests for you. Brilliant, that would be really cool. Test A, test B, test C. And just empty bodies. In other words, this is actually not how you're supposed to test three methods. You don't do a one-to-one -one relationship. It's, it's the very, you know, if you have a method A, you don't just write test A. It turns out you have to understand what the hell you're doing. But now we've got a tool that allows us to bypass that whole messy thinking process and do the wrong thing faster. We are focusing the, uh, you know, we are falling prey to exactly the problem that many people have when they look at software and they think it's a typing activity. No, it's a thinking activity. And that, program, that programmer over there in the corner who is typing less than that programmer over there who's furiously banging out, this, you know, they've got their two-hour loop music on, it's 150 beats per minute, and they are banging stuff out. That pr no, you don't want that code. You want that person to be in a team of one. You want this person over here, the one who's doing that kind of whole thinking thing pausing for a moment, reflecting, saying, you know what, I'm going to delete this because I don't think I need this. There is a better way of doing this. Or there is a library that does this. Or I believe somebody told me of a better solution. Let me see if I can find it. You want that program. It turns out it's an intellectual activity, which is where I started off with this thing. So I've talked about habitability. I've talked about this idea of thinking. I've talked a bit about skill. Um, I'd like to sort of start closing with this idea of understanding why it is that the quality of what you make and the quality of how you make it is going to have the greatest effect. So the bit I am going to agree with uh, Paul Graham on, I don't believe that hackers are painters, but I do believe they want to be makers of good things. And it's the good thing that I want to focus on. This is a um, uh, 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 result of this is a management-friendly diagram. Sorry, yes. Quadrant diagram. The universe is divided into four things. One of them is generally very good, and one of them is generally very bad. Okay? Yep, management-friendly. Um, so this comes to the MIT Sloan Review management, uh, <laughs> management rag. It's from about 2007, I think. Uh, a survey of organizations that had some kind of IT function, some kind of IT capacity. And um, the, it looked along two axes. How effective is your IT? How good is the stuff that you do? I mean, does it make sense? Do you have good build systems? Do you have all this kind of stuff? Uh, and then alignment with the organization. Wonderful business fluffy term, alignment. What does that actually mean? Well. Uh, there's lots of different interpretations, but one of them is if we have software developers and we have the larger organization, are the concerns and priorities of the larger organization the same as those for the group of software developers? Are their priorities not only similar, but are they driven by the same things? Do they respond in the same way to the same things? Do their schedules match? Do they have a kind of a level of understanding at that level? So in this sense, we obviously say alignment is a good thing. Now, the zone of joy is the top right-hand corner. That's where we want to be. IT-enabled growth. Highly aligned, highly effective. And you look at the numbers there, and it's just like the growth rate's fantastic. IT spending is going down. This applies to a minority of organizations, 7%. Then you have the steady-as-she-goes, business-as-usual quadrant, which is the maintenance zone, which actually isn't quite that bad. It's the um, not particularly aligned and not particularly effective. But it turns out you're not really losing any money and you're not really making any money, so you're not really getting anybody's way, but you're probably not winning too many friends in the organization, you know, in terms of, uh, yeah, oh, yes, IT, they're really good. And it's just like, oh, IT, you know. But nonetheless, it turns out three-quarters of the organizations are in this space. And it's not disastrous like we'd think it would be. But the standard business answer to what should we do, how should we get better, Oh, and the, by the way, the rules of the game is you can't go diagonally. It's like a rook in chess, okay? You, go, you only go one direction, all right? The obvious thing, because it's, 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 it's the stuff of business consultancy and MBAs, 
Um, and indeed, uh, sadly, a lot of agile uh, process consultancy, which is why I was trying to keep my feet on the ground uh, when I'm doing that kind of consultancy, um, is to become more aligned. What we're going to do is we're going to take a group of, uh, we're going to take our developers who are not necessarily doing the best thing in the best way. That may be through no fault of their own. Don't forget, we are often driven by our environment and other factors, as some of the other slides have demonstrated. And what we're going to do is we're going to take them, and they're not really gelled as a team. They're not really totally focused on the technical practices. And what we're going to do is we're going to align them, because that'll be good. Except the numbers say otherwise. The numbers up here, this is the alignment trap, say that you're going to lose money hand over fist, and um, you're going to spend an awful lot more on your IT. Oh, that's not right. That's not what we wanted. It turns out that the other axis, the, well, let's just get really you know, much better at our technical practices. Let's just become better at developing software. Let's become better as a team. Let's use better tools, better skills. Let's improve the nature of our craft and our ability to execute it, whilst not necessarily being aligned with the organization. It turns out that that turns out quite well, well-oiled IT. Now, I don't want to go on record as saying, um, doing the wrong thing better is the way forward. That's not what I'm saying. Uh, I, I'm assuming that you're not going to get any worse. But there is this idea of being able to execute the basic skills and the ability um, more effectively, more efficiently. In other words, yeah, we developed this well. Oh, we developed the wrong thing. Well, that's not a problem because we developed it so well, it's easy to change. Whereas in the other path, we have no idea what we're doing, but we've just had another deadline thrown at us. And we're doing the wrong thing as well. We don't have time. But we need to get better. We don't have time to get better. So we end up with this kind of dialogue. The core practices, this is intellectual stuff. This is non-trivial. And we actually see, and I'm going to go back to paintings to end this, we actually see examples of where working on your basic craft demonstrates this. And it turns out that doing, if you don't focus on that, it won't be the area in which you improve. You know what's coming. It's painted, it's a church in Spain, it was painted in the 1930s. Eke homo, and it's profound. And it fell into disrepair. So a little old lady, 80 years old, Cecilia Jimenez, took it upon herself to restore this. And she's a little bit of a dabbler. She likes to do a little bit of painting. Now, I'm not going to accuse, you know, as I said, there are some software developers who like to do a little painting, and that's fine. I'm sure they do a little bit better than Cecilia did. <laughs> um, and this has become something of a, a uh, sort of, well, actually, it's turned out to be a great revenue earner for the church. People are queuing up and paying to see this. The family, the family of the original artist is up in arms about this and wants to sue her. Meanwhile, she has got a lawyer who's trying to sue the church for a share of the profits. <laughs> but do not assume that this will be the consequence of your code. I see this. This is the kind of, yeah, I'm self-taught. You know, I don't need kind of, you know, and I don't need team practice, and I don't need to kind of communicate with other people because my code walks on water. Um, uh, so on. this is the problem. Um, if, you, if you don't, you know, and I'm sure Cecilia Jimenez can run off a lot of these just like that. And that's the important point, that we want to get better at the thing, the basic execution of a brush stroke. That would be a good start. And so, therefore, something as complex as a large software system is built from the very ground of taking people's inspiration, perspiration, their passion, their desire for a little bit of elegance, their desire for a well-turned architectural hack, taking that and trying to harness it in some way, in a way that allows everybody to say, yes, business value, that's a good thing, and yet allows people to enjoy the intellectual challenge and rewards of creating a software system. So I will leave the last word to Douglas Crockford, who, author of the surprisingly sim volume, JavaScript, The Good Parts, Programming is difficult business. It should never be undertaken in ignorance. Thank you very much.